Um, before we start, I'd like to remind the audience to please uh, be behave. Silence <laughs> your phone, don't walk in and run out of the room uh, while speakers are speaking. Do it in between speeches. Uh, having said that, without further ado, on the motion that superhumans should submit to the registration, I'd like to welcome Prime Minister. Yeah. Yeah. In a world where we have superheroes and supervillains running amok, when we have heroes fighting villains in the street, when we have chaos and destruction, and when the state doesn't know who is who, when the state doesn't know who it should support, who is against them, who supports the more to protect society, and all these sort of things, it is very confusing as a state to know who is on the good side, who, was, who is on the bad side, who should state cooperate with, and who should states not cooperate with. Like, uh, this debate needs to assume that, for example, the US government has launched an, in an initiative to provide public registries for superheroes. That means that, like, under this model, let's just clarify how this world looks like, right? Under this model, a few things are going to happen. If you are a superhero, you will have an option to register with the government. This registration will entail public registries of your superheroes, or your superhero name, your secret identity, yeah. your powers, and other forms of identifying information that states can then hold you accountable for. Secondly, states will extend protection over those superheroes and like super superhumans who do register. For example, putting them in safer neighborhoods, You're like uh, having more patrols, allowing them to stay together to protect each other, these sort of things. This will then protect the superhumans who like protect the superhumans from other people who mean them harm. Sit down. Thirdly, superheroes must then subscribe to the law and the state. If not, right, the state will then retaliate by sending other superheroes who are pro-state, for example, after them, this sort of check and balance, but the state can also deny the protection that they currently offer under this model. But thirdly, they would treat them as potential uh, enemies in any form of conflict, like superhuman conflict. But lastly, that the state will release even more personal information, identifying information that can make like, like their lives really miserable if they don't want to subscribe to the state. These are some forms of checks and balances that would, uh, that would exist in this world. We believe that as a superhuman, we would subscribe to this registration for two reasons. I'm going to look at these two reasons in my speech. But firstly, I'm going to tell you how registration shows that a particular superhuman is committed to the state's defense and to our society's law and order. And secondly, I'm going to tell you how unmasking superheroes will allow society to back them up and stand behind them and how it's important to have a united front against crime and all forms of evil. But before I look at that, sure. If I, as a superhero, am wholeheartedly against registering, will the government force me to follow this policy? Uh, no, it is entirely optional. However, if you choose not to register, we will treat you as potential enemies in the conflict. We will yeah. think that you may not be able to you may not be on our side, and we will like take measures to prevent should you eventually do be against us. First argument. How registration shows that a particular superhuman is committed to state defense and moral. I've already told you in the status quo, we have vigilante heroes such as Batman running around fighting evil, when we have the police then running around after Batman because they think he's the bad guy. Right? When we have no. like for a situation like Spider-Man, yeah, yeah. like fighting crime, right? But the police think that because he wear a mask, he might also be a criminal. He might be in collusion with this criminal. Right, when you also have bad superheroes such as Magneto going around robbing banks, like opening the vaults with his magnetic powers. When you have people like Doc Ock who build weird labs to have weird experiments to do weird things with his body and other people, other people are around right, him. In the eyes of the state, these are all the same type of people but th but we don't think that this we don't think that that's the case you we are. must recognize that some superheroes are good and some superheroes yeah, yeah, yeah. are bad yeah, sit yeah. down right the metric that the state uses to decide whether you are good or bad is whether you obey the law we think that it comes down to situations such as fighting supervillains superheroes cannot always obey the law superheroes cannot always avoid uh, avoid collateral damage we think that it's particularly harmful it's particularly harmful when states try to target the good superheroes who are trying to fight crime and fight evil yeah, yeah. because you then make their life extremely difficult and then you then make them 
even harder for you to fight a crime. But the, like, it's even worse because the state is wasting resources fight, uh, running after the superheroes. They have less resources to run after the supervillain, which means that, it's, that the state is effectively counterproductive in trying to fight crime at the end of the day. How does our policy change that, right? So when the states and superheroes are on the same side, when you register, right, that means you are, uh, you are publicly uh, acknowledging that you then subscribe to the state's uh, morals, this changed things because the state and superhero will now be on the same side. So when you go after crime, sit down, the state will not target you as a potential criminal. But this is particularly, uh, what, it, what, what's particularly good about this policy is that when superheroes need help, the state can then help them. Like in the movie, for example, Transformers, right? When the Autobots wanted to go after the Decepticons, the US military did help them by sending Thermahawk yeah, missiles, yeah. by, send, by firing a rail gun, a high powered laser missile that eventually did help, yeah, eventually did help to kill some Decepticons. We think this was a crucial losing the war against the Decepticons, and it's because they because they and the state managed to work together, they eventually managed to achieve a better outcome. Sit down. However, we further argue that the benefits about this is that there's a further check and balance to the state, because individually, the state can hunt and kill down every single hero. Collectively, all superheroes are more powerful than the state. The problem is that they are not on that all, not all superheroes are bad. We have good superheroes, we have bad superheroes. So under this policy, when, when good superheroes do register, there's an incentive for heroes not to go rogue, right? That means that like after a while, if they're, they get angry, they won't like go and do bad stuff because they know that the state will come after them. However, it's also an incentive for the states not to go rogue against these superheroes. So if the state gets a bit paranoid and say, we don't have power over you, because you, because they are collectively registered together, registered together, because it's a collection of good superheroes together, the state will not then go and kill these good superheroes if they pose thing that pose a threat to society. The conclusion of the argument is this. When the state knows who their allies are, you make the fight against the bad guy so much easier. That's particularly important to recognize in this debate. Second argument, unmasking superheroes will allow society to back up and stand behind this hero. Because we must recognize the status quo when people don't know who is good and who is bad. So people don't know what to think. When Spider-Man may have saved their lives from a robber, but states are branding Spider-Man as a bad guy, as a vigilante and a lawbreaker, that people don't necessarily know what to think. They don't know what's happening. This is harmful because the heroes won't get cooperation from society and law enforcement, when, especially when they might need it to fight crime. But secondly, because there's a possibility that society could be supporting someone, someone who doesn't have their best interests at heart because they are un unable to tell the difference. Under our policy, society is able to differentiate between those heroes who subscribe to public law and those heroes who don't. That means they can and will support these heroes when public cooperation is needed. But more importantly, we think that you as an individual hero, you need to know that the society is standing behind you. We think it's particularly important for your self-esteem to know that you are on the good side, that people are willing to support you, you are fighting a good fight, you have a purpose in life. Our side is the one that gives this public support to the superheroes. Our side makes the lives of heroes much easier, much easier in terms of fighting crime, in terms of maintaining law and order. We are supremely proud. And to open the case inside opposition, please welcome the leader of opposition. If to distinct themselves, or we think there are specific reasons as to why vigilantes yeah. do what they do. When they distinct themselves from a system that they believe is failing, when they distinct themselves from a system that they believe doesn't serve justice to minorities, doesn't provide closure, and at the end of the day, victimizes individuals who deserve justice, we think that they are the individuals who do, at the end of the day, serve justice. I'm going to prove two arguments. One, why individual autonomy is better for vigilantes. And secondly, why the safety of society is better under our paradigm. But before that, three points 
of rebuttal. One is confusion, a big issue in today's debate. Because the large premise of the arguments that came from the Prime Minister was based upon us not being able to identify these individuals. To which we say, we can. If individuals don't attack the authorities, we can identify them as good uh, as a good party within a war. If individuals do uh, attack the authorities, then it's vice versa. But even if, even under their own premises of their arguments, when we use examples like the Transformers, A, we, we were able to identify at the end of the day who was correct and who was wrong, and B, they still didn't subscribe to state laws within the movie of Transformers, so our policy can still work under our parent. So confusion isn't really a big issue. We can identify who's who. Don't base the debate upon that. But secondly, they're giving states way too little credit. At the end of the day, states have the ability to research upon these individual states, can assess what is being done by a person by virtue of his actions. Second point of rebuttal, whether this is a fair model, we think it's a negative reinforcement, a reinforcement which blackmails superheroes that are protecting our, our country, that blackmails superheroes that are defending the safety of society within today's world. At worst point, if which an individual chooses to snap and he doesn't really care about the information that his state has, you turn individuals against the state, you turn superheroes against the state because they believe that they're being constrained within the law and they believe that the law isn't doing them justice. A negative reinforcement antagonizes the people that you say weren't supporting the law to begin with. But is it really a choice? We don't think so. It is a Hobson's choice by virtue of being hunted down if you don't comply within a policy. It's a Hobson's choice if you don't have an ability to say no when the state is waging a war against you. So individuals don't have the ability to consent. You place them under that Hobson's choice. But even if it creates a segregation, which is worse, individuals who are hunted down create way more collateral damage. Individuals who are hunted by, down by the state create way more casualties and innocent lives lost via the Marvel Civil War. War, right? So the harms that you try to minimize by reducing the accountability of superheroes is exacerbated. So when people are antagonized and they don't want to subscribe to that registration, that is when your harms are worse. No, thank you. Last point of rebuttal. Will this help in the fight against crime? They say you can help individuals who are uh, uh, altruistic in terms of vigilantism. We can still help these individuals. We can identify them. It's not really a debate. But a, a debate about public cooperation. He said when people can identify who these people are, it's easier for the public to cooperate. I think it's pretty simple. Insofar as these individuals are seen as defending the innocent, the public are more likely to cooperate. Insofar as this person is harming an innocent life on the ground, that is how society reacts. We don't need legal recourse for society to cooperate with vigilantes. Insofar as they're doing something good in the eyes of the people, that is how they will get their cooperation. No, thank you. Why individual autonomy is better? Both parties within this war fight for a same cause, the state and the vigilantes. The only difference at the end of the day is the way in which they fight it and the different set of morals that they have. Vigilantes broke free of a system which they thought didn't serve justice towards the individuals. They broke free of a system which didn't give closure towards minorities and didn't give closure towards victims. They set their own moral standards and they act upon it. And this is what creates uniqueness within these individuals which allow them to be better at what they do. They they don't follow the law and when they don't follow the law that is when they produce results that is when they capture more criminals that is when they cripple more organizations that are illegal forcing them to serve under the same system which they resent forcing them to register under the same system which they broke free of makes it harder for them to be effective you force them to work within the law that they hate you force them to work within the law that they don't trust to begin with so at the end of the day, A, you demean their effectiveness because you stray them from their abilities to create change. If they used to do it illegally by uh, not following things like warrants in terms of breaking into another person's house or not interrogating an individual following moral standards, if you take this away from these individuals, you severely decrease their effectivity when it comes to combating crime. And it's proven two things. One, that these measures that individuals take, although might have a although they might be different in sets of morals, are A, effective, B, serve justice, and at the end of the day, this side of the house compromises this. They create a segregation of morals and they cause more collateral damage. So individual autonomy on individual's perception as to what is right is much better under our paradigm. But secondly, we're willing to comply. Some people will make mistakes. We are fine with it. Even all police officers or law enforcement in today's world make mistakes. But that doesn't mean they have to comply within a state model. If they can compensate for it by saving more victims. We understand that people will make mistakes, but that doesn't warrant the state hunting them down and placing their own judgments as to morality. So individual autonomy might not be absolute, but it's the best alternative that we have because it allows individuals to operate within a system that they are comfortable with. 
No, thank you. Why is safety better under our paradigm? One, exposure of information, A, harms the individual's families, the relatives, and individuals they come into contact with. Following the Marvel Civil War, when Spider-Man's entire family died, and all the relatives and the individuals who is associated yeah, yeah. with that, we don't see how they perpetuate any more safety which circulates around these individuals. Before I move on to my second level of analysis, sure. Sir, we recognize that release, the release of information poses, uh, poses danger, but tell us how that is mutually exclusive when all this information can already be found out by those people that were hunting it down. But you said the government doesn't know anything. You said the government cannot identify who is right, who is wrong. So how can the government research and identify at the end of the day? So there's a contradiction there. Try to clear it up. Second, it exposes these individuals in particular and the individuals that they associate themselves with. A lot of teenagers, a lot of superheroes are teenagers. That means the schools that they go to, the clubs that they go to, all these things are jeopardized and the social structures around them are hard. They have to defend these things being crippled because individuals who are willing to make these attacks have the ability and have the information and have the agency to do this. This creates two outcomes. It hampers the ability to serve justice because you create a division of focus as to a priority of self-safety, familial safety, and then only save it, serving justice. You create that focus and you force them to make choices at times which might harm other individuals because they couldn't ensure that they were safe. Lastly, how we think that individuals have higher levels of morality and have no political motivation. Individuals are not affiliated with the government. In a war, both sides commit atrocities and both sides are not proud of it. Vigilantes have the ability to assess what's right and follow those sets of standards. When governments can use them to exploit their own opinions, their own politically motivated uh, uh, objectives, we think that that's harmful. They should be able to follow their own standards, standards that they are comfortable to, and standards that allow them to do what they do best. In status quo, anyone who tries to fight for the battle of good are always easily identifiable and are always open to the prospect of accountability for whatever they do. We don't think that the principle should disregard superheroes by virtue of them being more powerful, by virtue of them being able to do a lot more than, than normal law enforcement authorities. I'm going to talk about three issues in this debate. Number one, what is the mutual check and balance that exists between the state and superheroes and how is this beneficial to a lot of the harms that we talked about. Secondly, I want to talk to you about is the problem of being, of, is, is there fundamentally more harms under superheroes that will affect their ability to solve crime? And thirdly, I'll talk about how we are able to enhance generally the quality of superheroes if they were to take in additional input from the state and improve their superhero fighting ability. First, let's look at the idea of how mutual check and balance fundamentally exists, something that completely went disregarded from Kishan. TG argued too explicitly that mutual check and balance exists when you have superheroes colluding with the state under this policy. This means that effectively superheroes will have to agree, no sit down, superheroes will effectively have to agree to what, what the state talks about, but also states have to inherently agree with superheroes. Why was this especially true? Let's sit down. Number one, let's analyze the probabilities of the state going rogue and what happens when superheroes are able to solve this problem. Let's assume that Kishin was true when he said that the state is a failing system, that the state will never be able to work. Now, effectively, when I as a superhero register under the state, I now can be able to push the rhetoric that if I'm going to be working together with you, inherently, you have to fix these problems that are existing within your current law enforcement. This is something that can only occur if you are able to push idea that superheroes have to work with the state. We think collectively, and this is why it's important from Taiji, that collectively superheroes are able to generate that sufficient cloud to then push the state and then effectively garner that policy. No, sit down. 
But what happens under the model that assuming that these superheroes or one of these superheroes go rogue, we think then we don't think it's a fundamental problem because then we think that the state is able to use other superheroes to hunt down these supervillains or these superheroes who went rogue. Arguably, the, the, the characterization is fundamentally this. A state inherently is far more powerful than individual superheroes. But the state is not more powerful than collective superheroes or the Avengers, for example, or the X-Men. But it's far more powerful than individuals like Spider-Man, individuals like Batman. So we think collectively, the argument that they're trying to portray on how there isn't a check and balance is something that we cannot contend with. Why? Because if you were to buy into the argument that check and balance never exists, that superheroes inherently do not want to opt into the state policy because the state is inefficient, now we think you solve that. When superheroes effectively join the state, they can use this as a prerogative. Now you need to fix this law enforcement and effectively we'll do inherently what you think is best. We think that colluding is something that is effective under this model. Yes, Kishan. So if you say that these people can use political pressure to try to change the system, aren't you shafting your prime minister who said the moment they challenge the state and the prerogatives of the state will reveal more information yeah, yeah. and will blackmail them? This is where political clout is especially important for you to understand. Like the state, like I told you, is not more powerful than a single individual, but it's far less powerful than a collective group of individuals. So therefore, the state is far unlikely to want to challenge a rhetoric that is supported by a lot of superheroes. Effectively, we think they're going to think that they are inherently wrong, as opposed to the mentality that they want to lash out against a collective group that is far more powerful for them. We don't think that the rhetoric is something that is sufficient from the other side. The second issue in this debate that we need to acknowledge is, will this effectively harm uh, the process of the, the thinking mentality of superhero and make it far difficult for them to fight crime? Kishan argued a number of things, and we deal with them one by one. Firstly, he told us that we antagonize superheroes by forcing them to want to subscribe to a state system that is failing. Number one, we think that count, the converse is more true. We think if you're going to force superheroes to live in a world that people antagonize them or people do not know what they're fighting for, we think that's explicitly harmful. His response to the idea that confusion doesn't exist was blatantly too simple. He argued that if you're not going to kill anybody that's good, that means you're on the good side. But truth is, collateral damage will always affect those who are good. Inherently, at the end of the day, Superman fighting the war against the bad guys will inherently lead to the destruction of the entire upstate New York. So technically, your argument of how superheroes inherently are objectively good false. But more importantly, let's look at the example of Batman, right? Like he never even killed anybody good, yet he was the target of individuals because the assumption was that he might turn bad. The assumption was, or the fear of people operating on, was the assumption that a superhero might then one day decide to go into the bad life. And there was the assumption that people want to target these individuals. So the confusion and ambiguity exists not on by virtue of his crime solving ability, but the prospect of him eternally fighting crime. And we think that's why states try to clear this confusion up. Second, he argued that superheroes fear about their family. That's why we cannot reveal private information. Wow, this is like contradictory in a number of stances. Like number one, we have to understand that supervillains or people who are generally superheroes but bad would already know about the, the private information about families. Like when you look at superhero movies, for example, the supervillains are the first ones to be able to identify the superheroes. But even then, even under the argument that now in our policy makes it far easier for supervillains to then target these individuals, we don't think that's a fundamental problem. Because we think that superheroes consented to these problems in the first place before they wanted to fight crime. But more importantly now, you have a state protection that's able to garner more support for these individuals rather than having superheroes alone to fight supervillains in the event that the families are found out, in the event or the prospect that they are alone in the fight against evil. We think that the collective input of the state now assists in the battle against fighting evil. We're not going to, we're not willing to leave individuals are fighting for a state prerogative to fight alone. No, sit down. What I'm going to argue to you about in my speech, why is a state perspective inherently good and why should we consider the input of the state? We have to argue that the idea that superheroes are eternally good and eternally good willing is true. Like they will always want to fight for the best cause possible. But is it necessarily the best possible thing that they can do? Inherently, we argue to you that by virtue of being a superhero, that doesn't make you more rational. It doesn't make you have a higher intellectual ability to then find the best form of avenue to channel your energy or your power to solve crime. Effectively, when you look at examples like Hancock, he's a really powerful guy and a really good guy. But inherently, he was like downright stupid. Like he decided to destroy a lot of buildings in order to achieve his end goal. How do our policies solve that problem? Because now superheroes 
operate on the mentality that they are accountable only to themselves. We think there's a very false mentality because especially when they are argue, when their actions have a severe repercussions onto a lot of people, we think the state should then represent the ideologies of the people and then consider those decisions with the superheroes. Why is, should I as a superhero want to do this inherently at the end of the day? I want to do this because I do not want to inherently harm more people by acting irrationally. I do not want to cause more collateral damage than I could have if I colluded with the state and perhaps evacuated an entire area before I sent the harm. So for example, these are examples that show you how state colluding with superheroes is a far more effective policy because now you have an additional input rather than forcing superheroes to want to think for themselves and are later accountable for serious damages that they could have avoided. For all those reasons, we are very proud to propose. It is very simple. The ability for a superhero to hide his identity is very, very important to a superhero because it can harm himself, it can harm his ability to help other people, and it can harm his ability to protect his family members and the ones that he loves, who never wanted to be a part of this war, who never wanted to be a part of this fight. This side of the house chose to conveniently dismiss this piece of argumentation and a bunch of other stuff that Kishan told you in today's debate. Before moving on to positive matter, a couple of questions to cite government in terms of rebuttal. Number one, why this forces individuals or superheroes to move for positive int intentions to not function properly? Because their response It is our response to harm individuals, so he tries very best to reduce collateral damage. But what about instances like Batman? What about instances? First of all, it's a minority of cases. But second of all, I'm fairly certain that a rational person would be able to weigh the consequences and understand that in certain circumstances, people have to make trade-offs and there is collateral damage that exists. But his argument or his example of Batman proves a harm in of itself, meaning the law enforcement in that particular area is already flawed because that person or that law enforcement is shooting an innocent person who doesn't, who is not aware whether or not Batman is good or bad in the particular circumstances. That flaws and proves to you that the law enforcement is already flawed in the first place. Yeah. So secondly, it is a Hobson's choice because if, and quote Taijir, that if you do not choose to submit yourself, you are automatically seen as a possible enemy and you automatically be targeted by the government. What is the outcome of this model? First of all, either A, that they are forced into this model and they are forced to submit themselves because if they don't, they are subject to guns and subject to the government. But second of all, we think that the other likely outcome is that people who just have superheroes who are average layman citizens like you and me, students, politicians, parents, adults, are just likely to go underground. Are just likely to just forfeit their powers because they are less likely to want to participate in this circumstance. This means in a world where we can accept that superheroes and superheroes simultaneously exist, superheroes are more likely to just go away because they don't want to subscribe themselves to the system but supervillains still exist and we think that that's a problem if they wanted to solve it in the first place. Next, he told us that there were superheroes can change these issues pure are very clear. If you question the government's action, the question the manner in which the government functions, you're automatically seen as a danger to the government and will reveal more information. And that's a contradiction to your first argumentation in the first place. But secondly, how do you expect a superhero to change structural reforms in the state and the law that has failed to pro like provide justice to a bunch of minorities when months and years of trying has already failed in failing when it comes to racism? Second of all, why is the state good? Because he told us that there are very a lot of superheroes who are stupid like Hancock who don't have an ability to fix these kinds of things. We'd rather these individuals make mistakes, fix those mistakes, and then become better individuals because they have intentions that are in of itself positive and can help the world uh, make, become the world a uh, much better place. But that's a minority of cases, negating the fact that a mass majority of superheroes do their job very efficiently in circumstances like Iron Man, circumstances like Spider-Man, in all these kinds of circumstances, these individuals do their jobs very efficiently. Yes. Iron Man is all shot without consenting the repercussions of the decision. Tell me how under your model or the principle itself that I as a superhero have the ability to rationalize far better than anyone else and not want to consider anyone else. At the very end of the day, Iron Man solved the problem, made it much better and solved and prevented people from dying. But on the example of Iron Man, when he revealed to everyone that he was Iron Man, people shot his home, he nearly died, and his house got destroyed. That's an example and the dangers of revealing specific information to you and about your family members in the first place. So Iron Man would have died in that very scenario, but didn't and got lucky. It's not the same for other superheroes in the first place. 
What was talked about by Kishan that was not responded to? Kishan told you a number of things. He told you that these individuals want to break free from a flawed system because they just can't get the justice that they wanted. So they may have different morals and we concede to that. But at the very least, we would trade it off for better outcomes. This means that these examples include black banter that was broke out of this because of racist issues and he wanted to fight the law that was racist. Then he told us that states can use superheroes to fight supervillains. And is this argument inherently true? Let's analyze this really rationally, right? First of all, superheroes will naturally fight supervillains anyway. This means that the superhero that has, uh, whether or not he joins the government or not, will naturally have an incentive to fight because of his power, because that he has a duty, with great power comes great responsibility, all those kinds of things. But second of all, he's less likely to do his power much efficiently when he's constrained by the laws and constrained by the methods in which the states force him to abide. And we don't think that he's able to do any better than he could have done on his own. So we don't think it necessarily makes it better. But he completely chose to negate the fact that he makes the lives of people who he loves, his uncles, his aunties, his brothers and sisters, his or her, that makes it much better, much worse in this circumstance because it's easier for villains to target, use these individuals as hostages, keep them hostage because that denies the superhero the ability to use his power and make the villain like lose in this particular circumstance. So we think that many of the circumstances, so like for example, in Civil War, the Punisher was sent and he wanted to kill Spider-Man as a result of Spider-Man revealing his identity and that inherently led to the destruction and the murder of his family members. These are examples to prove that these are the outcomes that we would never rather trade off and superheroes are much better to do it in a more efficient way. My positive matter, why we can provide for better justice and better ability to deliver that justice, extending on Kishin. First of all, we have to acknowledge and have to accept those also not responded to by side government, that governments have political motives and never make the justice for individuals the primary concern when it comes to war, when battling an individual. So when it comes to war and when it comes to fighting individuals on the ground, their concern is to either A, cripple the economy of the opposition or win the war faster as opposed to helping innocent people as opposed to helping individuals save each other. This is not the motive or not the political innuendo of superheroes. And this is exclusive to a superheroes when it comes to this matter, meaning that superheroes will have more of an incentive to do good things and things that are benefit, uh, free from innuendos and free from political motives that are beneficial towards society. You put them in this system, meaning they are chosen to subscribe to the same innuendos. So Operation Desert Storm would have become even worse when they send superheroes into these kinds of nations, even though like you know, no uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction were fine at the very end of the day. So we think you governments can use this to abuse the power that they already have. And if they've already done in the past, the harm is magnified when they can do it better with superheroes. But second of all, it is very much easier for supervillains to win in these circumstances because there's an asymmetry of information and there's an asymmetry of power. So Spider-Man doesn't know anything about Punisher, where he comes from, who his family members are and what his motives are, but Punisher knows everything about Spider-Man because the government chose to release important information that could kill Spider-Man and kill the family members of Spider-Man, which led to the immediate destruction of his family members and the murder of his family members, which makes it A, harder for individuals to do the good work that they wanted to do, which is the outcome of this model, B, kill innocent individuals who never wanted to be a part of this policy, but C, allow individuals to be forced to subscribe into a world in which they are forced to condone to co political innuendos and political motives. Very proud to oppose. When I chose to be a superhero, I've already, cons I've already consented to the harms that would eventually be inflicted upon me. I already know that my family is in danger. I already know that I am in danger. But the problem here is we aren't sure whether these superheroes are fighting the good, that the, that fighting the good of society. This debate boiled down to two issues. Number one, is individual autonomy important? And secondly, 
Will this model benefit the state as well as the super people? Firstly, is, this, is, individual, is individual autonomy important? Yes, we recognize that individual autonomy is important. That's why we don't inherently to register themselves. Their contention was this was a Hobson's choice. We don't think so. Recognize the characterization and assuming that that characterization rang, rang through, that they, that they hate the state so much and they hate the state value so much, they will inherently be able to opt out. There is an opt out system, guys. This isn't a Hobson's choice. But even if we recognize that this were, we, even if we recognize that they don't opt out, no thank you, we think that you make things much better because now you expose these individuals to how the state actually works. What happens then? Number one, you make the state inherently better at crime fighting because you have more efficient people within your system. But secondly, you could potentially also make these super superheroes, no thank you, not want to hate the state so much by virtue of them being of, at an alliance with the state. Yeah. It is a win-win situation. Hence, the idea of this Hobson's choice falls and their only contention for individual autonomy also falls as well. But we also need to recognize, why then do we need to forego, forego individual autonomy in this instance? Number one, because vigilantes, or in this instance, superheroes, are not accountable to anyone. Already extensively talked about in Levin's speech, but never responded by Roshan. The fact that individuals go out on their own accord, and they take measures into their own hands, because they perceive that the state has already failed. This means that they no longer, they, this means that they are less likely to have the bigger picture in mind, but rather to, to, to go out in society and to catch a singular criminal at whatever cost it takes. Recognizing that superheroes will, like, don't have an inherent obligation to represent the will of the people or to be accountable to a great, greater society, this means that they are less likely to want to cater to the utility of the majority when fighting crime. What are we talking about? We're talking about even more collateral damage, even more innocent people getting harmed. When Superman flies through the air and uses his laser vision to shoot buildings when he's looking for a supervillain, this is bad. This is collateral. When the conclusion of that was an, en an entire city was destroyed. Yeah. This is the collateral that is only resulted when vigilantes are not accountable to the people and are not accountable to the utility of the majority. This is, this is very bad because under these instances, we have to revoke their individual autonomy and place them under state jurisdiction. No, thank you. But then, does this removal of individual autonomy result in the lack of security and safety? Because they argue now they are going to be afraid, afraid that their families are endangered, afraid that their friends are endangered. They are unable to focus on fighting crime. This is not mutually exclusive. Because assuming that you're already a superhero, this means you already know that there are supervillains out there to catch you. I.e., when you are a superhero, you know that you, you know they are more likely to have supervillains out there to, like, to, uh, to capture your family. We give examples like in The Incredibles, when Buddy went all the way to Mr. and Mrs. Incredibles' house to, stay, to like, kidnap their child, this already exists, irregardless of whether or not we really do we think that under these instances, because that because the harms are mutually exclusive, it is moot. No, thank you. But recognizing this, we have these instances, you, you may force certain individuals to feel less safe. But because you're already backed by the state, and because you're already backed by support structures from these instances, we think it's far better. The comparative is here. Under your side, you're fighting that fight alone. You are alone in the war against crime. But on the side of government, you have support structures from the state. Your individual autonomy here needs to be forgotten for the benefits that can be accrued from side of government. Before I move on, sure. No? All right. Second issue. Will this benefit the state and also these super people? Because we need to recognize a couple of things. They argue that the states are corrupted. They argue that the states are inefficient. They argue that the states are bad. Sure, we recognize that this might be true in certain instances. But recognizing that a check and balance that exists under our model, when you have a bunch of superheroes who are banded together, they are more the critical mass in order to alter certain state values that are deemed bad. What are we talking about? We're talking about when individuals within the state system in itself, now by virtue of them registering, are able to now like, uh, like change the support structures within the state. How? Number one, 
in order in, in terms of state workforce when you allow like more efficient people to enter your support your, your state structures you create better police force for example when you have superheroes that can run faster than criminals and catch them before they get away you then improve police force when you have individuals that can look through like buildings and find like find the find the bombs that a certain terrorist may implant you then already improve your state workforce the comparative is here these people are now fighting the same fight that the state is fighting. But the comparative is they are now accountable to the utility of the majority. But secondly, the largest contention about state values. But we now recognize that under these instances from site government, they can now band together. And like most probably the state will feel that their values are wrong and they are corrupted in nature. They argue political motives will exist by the state. But number one, this exists under your own model, but will never be changed. Because under your instance, there is never an incentive for the state to change in terms of political motives. But secondly, we recognize that even if there are political motives under site government, you do have that incentive. States are now less likely to want to follow up through with their corrupted measures when you have the Avengers, for example, within your, within your structures that could potentially check and balance them. But lastly, the idea of state support. We recognize that the state, like within side opposition, will like in, in, inherently antagonize these people. But under the side of government, you allow society to like properly to properly support them because now they are they recognize that you are fighting a legitimate cause to fight for. But secondly, and most importantly, the state can now help you examples of the transformers when individuals went to the state and sought them for help we recognize that under these instances they might be trade-offs that we need to make but from side of government the trade-off of your privacy can never come at the expense of the lives of the majority I'd like to start this debate in loving memory of Captain America, who died as a result of this policy being passed by team government, which caused the Marvel Civil War. But when you remove a superhero's biggest weapons, which are his anonymity and personal autonomy, not only do you segregate your strongest community from within, you also piss them off, quite simply said. So I'll ask two questions in my speech to deal with the contentions being brought up by team government. The first question, will the state be able to cooperate heroes if this policy is passed? What already happens in status quo? We think that the state can cooperate with heroes to battle an objective evil. Therefore, if the Transformers are fighting a national threat, you don't need to know the, who, what their real names are yeah. to know that they're fighting for the sake of the majority. But two, the state gives superheroes autonomy in certain circumstances to ensure there's a higher efficiency if the states themselves cannot Batman good in terms of assessing the scene or getting as much information. Three, states allow superheroes to remain anonymous. But finally, the state understands that superheroes have a natural incentive to protect people yeah. and not harm them by virtue of them taking on that cape and protecting the people on their nightly routines. No, thank you. Why do you make it worse? Firstly, you have more state intervention in your side. What we think this does is it's a waste of more resources if every time a crime happens, not only does Batman have to go in there, but your police forces have to come in and cooperate with him in a very awkward situation because obviously Batman is much better. But two, more collateral damage is most likely to entail from the state intervention. You're still going to use Superman either way to fight your wars. Yeah, yeah. What happens is you order Superman to fight your wars the way the state wants him to. When he doesn't have any autonomy over his decisions, it's more likely for screw ups to happen. It's more likely for him to not be able to act in his best interest on the best interest of the public because he's fighting for the state, not for the people. But if you give the superhero more clout by allowing him to disclose his information, don't you then make it easy for the superhero to cover up his own tracks in your society if you argue to give him an extremely high social standing? So your side doesn't argue for that benefit either way. But the difference here is we think that theologies into the ways that superheroes can act. Look not only at Marvel, Marvel fanboys, look at DC, 
when Superman went to work for the government, what happened is we didn't say, God, Superman, you just do whatever you want. We'll support you. Instead, we use him for what we think is best to our benefits, to state ideologies that could be profit driven. If we think you end the war faster by killing a, killing a bunch of civilians, then kill the civilian Superman. We don't care. Political ideologies. Just take out the other parties. We can get elected in again. This is how you trivialize the nature of a superhero. In our side, we still have stupid states, but there's less influence from the stupid states, which gives these heroes the ability to act in the eyes of the public. The second reason why you make it worse is you disclose information, a big contention. Villains, the difference here is that, no thank you, if you were a villain and you wanted to get the information of Superman, you'd have to try very, 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 very hard. But what you do in team government is you disclose the information to not only the villains, but also public. Why is this then a lot worse? Because when they go home, they cannot stop being Spider-Man anymore. They have to always be Spider-Man. They have to always be on the defensive. Therefore, the ability for these superheroes to assimilate in your public is largely detracted when they have no public to go back to. You are now being looked at not as Peter Parker, but as Spider-Man. What does this do? You reduce the efficacy of your biggest weapons. They're less able to act however they want because they need to prioritize the safety of their families and themselves. Oh, yeah. Spider will go to bloody Thailand and the past to hide in the mountains because he's being put. Sorry, I didn't mean equity. So the second thing, <laughs> but you remove the impact that they have. So if you're going to protect them, the only thing you can do is disenfranchise them from society. So you're going to just move the whole superhero community up. The reason why this is bad is you remove their impact as superheroes or remove their ability, but you also increase you know, more over sensationalizing of the media where we just report, oh, Peter Parker is Spider-Man, oh, Bruce Wayne is Batman, what's he eating for lunch, and all that other nonsense. <laughs> so we think you make it harder for them to be seen as legitimate superheroes. But thirdly, and final thing in this issue, you antagonize the superhero community who opts out. Most important line. You as a state now decide morality. Therefore, what you do is, if a superhero isn't being moral, say it from PM, we will neutralize the superhero with other superheroes. Wow, civil war. Second, you will force them into it. So if you're going to force them into it, we don't see this as an actual choice because the state makes it a moral value to go into these things, but more peer pressure, more slander and public discrimination if you don't do it. So the public won't see you as a superhero anymore. And finally, you outsource the easy jobs to superheroes. Of course, Batman can stop a thief thing, but we have the police for a reason and we save the heroes for other reasons. You can't just use them to whatever situation is convenient. Why is this harmful? One, you make the superhero community in shambles. You're fighting superheroes with superheroes. Therefore, they're not as powerful collectively, but they're more likely to go rogue if they're trying to protect themselves compared to the community as a whole. So more superheroes acting outside the lines of a community that could have kept them inside but you also reduce their personal autonomy. So superheroes have to fight it out some more in order to prove who's the best superhero, in order to prove which side is the best. And I think that out the outcome is just more collateral damage. Before I move into the last issue, yes. Sir, your argument is that sort of new because you've never heard of that proposition. But please engage, why then are superheroes more accountable and why do you reduce collateral under your model? So superheroes are accountable to a certain thing we like to call the public. That's why they choose to be superheroes. Superheroes could have very well chosen to be selfish. They could have chosen to be super villains, but no, they chose to be superheroes for a reason. Therefore, if they were as benevolent as you said, they would have gone to jail anyway they did a really bad thing, but my issue is really good too. So will this increase societal acceptance for superheroes on this whole point of ambiguity? Actions speak for themselves. That's how we distinguish you from a superhero to a supervillain. Usually the government is the one who persecutes the superhero. So when Batman was being persecuted, it wasn't the public, it was the police. Yeah. Therefore, in a situation where ambiguity is in the government, not the superhero, this means the governments aren't liked by the people. As said before, the governments are more likely to be corrupt, inadequate, and heroes give people the clarity that they want. But even if it's ambiguous, as stated by Kishin, it's impactful because superheroes can keep the, retain their anonymity and be seen as values or symbols. Why is this important? People are afraid of Batman, not because he's Bruce Wayne, but because he's Batman, because he's awesome. He inspires us to be more. He puts fear in the hearts of criminals to not go out there and do his bad things. So you get beat shit out anyways, but accountability. So we think the problem with your accountability argument is you shift the focus from a superhero's mistakes to government persecuting the superhero. So you remove closure and efficiency in actually dealing with the problem that is important at hand. Thank you.
the state can identify benevolence from evil. And we think that that was the fundamental premise that side government's case was based upon. An individual who's benevolent stops a mugging, does cause collateral damage, but does save innocent lives in compensation. Under their own examples and premises of the Transformers, we could identify those superheroes. We could identify them from the Decepticons because they were protecting human yeah, beings. Yeah. Even if they didn't follow the rule of the law, they still cooperated with the authorities. So superheroes can still work with the authorities. The justification that we never heard from side government was why did they have to come at the cost of their identities? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why did they have to come at the cost of their own national, their own safety and their own security? Their, pro their premise of their arguments are truistic, not mutually exclusive towards our paradigm. They can cooperate, but why does there have to be a higher leverage by the state on a superhero and why can't they work in equal power? They have a same cause. A superhero has no fight with the state, has no fight with the authorities, and even at best, if the authorities harm him, he still won't act against the state. There was no justification as to why the state should have a higher leverage of a superhero, why cooperation meant the state taking charge of a superhero and his abilities, especially since these are the same political motivations that a superhero chose to seek out of, the system that a superhero chose to break away from. So two questions that summarize this debate and prove why we want. Why safety is better achieved, even, even if they minimize the harm? And secondly, why is the degree of harm and collateral damage which side government tried to uh, protect much, much greater under their paradigm? Second question, how does this affect the superhuman? And why is this important towards the individual who could be doing good and the psychology of that person? First question. First, why, why is safety better under our paradigm? Even if they say a person consented into it, even if a person did consent to all the harms, that doesn't mean it warrants us the right to give him those harms. It doesn't mean it warrants us the right to put him under the same security and the same pain and suffering that a person should go through. We make it extremely hard to find out your identity. A primary reason as to why a person keeps his identity is to protect his family members and to protect the ones that he loved. He didn't consent into his family members being harmed. He yeah, consented yeah. into himself being harmed. Why is it okay and justifiable to harm the relatives, the people that he loves, and the individuals who he protects? We don't think you make it easier to protect their families because A, you make it easier and more accessible to find this information. But even if, even if an individual consents into this, once his family dies, once the people who he knows are taken away from him, you reduce his effectivity as an individual, you make it harder for him to fight justice, you push him underground because he has nothing to live for anymore and he has no one to live for anymore. So the conclusion here is, even if a person consented to a system, you force them into a, into a hole, you break them away from the state. Yeah, Second, yeah. and the primary goal of side government was to minimize collateral damage. You don't minimize collateral damage. When you antagonize and you hunt down the other superheroes yeah. which didn't register for your system, that is when collateral damage is at its highest. That's when more buildings will be broken because it doesn't become a clash of the state versus a superhero. It becomes a clash of superheroes. Yeah. So the collateral damage, which was supposed to be their bread and butter at the end of today's debate, doesn't work because the collateral damage is harder. The Marvel Civil War caused destruction to more than one city more than yeah. thousands of individuals lost their lives and suffered so we don't see what they're trying to protect but how does this affect the superhuman we say it creates a division <laughs> a division in which it makes it harder for us to fight crime in society and it makes it harder for the individual to feel secure but secondly we told you that superheroes are absent of political motivation something that side government chose to ignore the fact is they broke out of a system which they didn't trust in they broke out of a system which they believe the state had been abusing for their own political motives so they don't support things like interventions that are not justified and it's it's not in a world where they have the ability to make that change. They have little to no political clout because under their premise, if they challenge the state, they'll be hunted down. So why is this policy justified? We don't see a reason. I thank the opposition reply. Um, to conclude this debate, please welcome the government reply.
I love the way Kishan likes to put in a lot of new matter and rebuttals in his reply. Anyway, this debate was decided upon three issues. Let me first talk to you about the first issue. First issue that exists is can we inherently help an individual superhero or do we help them more? Taiji started off the speech by arguing to you on the principle of anonymity and how that's a bad thing because we are not sure how to identify whether you're good or bad. The follow-up response from Kishan was that it's easy. If you don't shoot a bad guy, if you don't shoot a good guy, then you're good. If you shoot a bad guy, yeah, even better. So, but we don't think that rhetoric was simple because my response to that was it isn't only the fear of anon isn't only anonymity that causes confusion. It was the fear that the good guy will inherently turn bad. That is why we always want to kill you. So this this rhetoric was probably what was never engaged by them. But it's also something that I feel or able feel with a lot of examples because inherently we talk about how Batman was good and he helped them to the point until they turned against them. So arguing that rhetoric that the fear of the person wanting to turn against you because you're not really sure if the person is going to fight for you till the very end is something that causes that confusion, something that wasn't engaged by the other side. Secondly, he talked about how we want to protect individual third parties that are affiliated to superheroes. He argued that privacy is very important. It is the best thing that we can achieve. Three responses that we told you. Number one, Abel explicitly argued to you that in every movie you know, you always come to the conclusion where the family is always threatened. So inherent the logic would be that by virtue of being a supervillain, we cannot apply the same logic by telling me that state protection of this information will inherently not make it accessible for supervillains to find you. The question then becomes of side government we told you that assuming they do find you, do you want the state also to fight against you or do you want the state to be on board with you to fight against crime? Like the example was so simple, like when Bane decided to harm Batman, like there wasn't any state helping him. Inherently, he had to run away or he had to be in a prison till he could eventually regain his health and come back and fight against them. Second issue in this debate, can we fix problematic states, something that wasn't an issue that opposition decided to contend? We argue to you very simply on the idea of collective critical mass. This is very simple. When you have a bunch of superheroes like the Avengers or the X-Men subscribing to the state, and if the state chooses to want to use them for bad intentions, they can refuse to do so. And why the state will now not target them? Because they are far more powerful than the state. Like we, I explicitly argue to you, like the state is more powerful than an individual superhero. But the state make a lot of superheroes fight their battle. We think that's where the state will fear to do so and not want to subscribe to the rhetoric. We argue too, that's when you gain that form of check and balance in the state. Because any form of harm that they talked about, how governments being bad, will always exist under their model. And we think we tackle that problem by forcing this idea onto states that they have to subscribe to an idea that is mutually agreeable to both the state as well as superheroes in Honey MD. No response coming from them. Third issue, the issue that decided to tackle very heavily. Is this good for crime fighting inherently at the end of the day? We argue to you from Taiji onwards how there's a greater collective benefit if everyone decides to fight crime and not be fractioned between the confusion of who really is on your side inherently at the end of the day. We argue to you explicitly it is far better when the police force is not targeting you but with you and fighting crime. There wasn't a response coming from them. My speech explicitly, I brought you the new argument how collateral damage is something that exists on the perspective of every individual. No, we can't put this in a debate. We're talking about individuals like you and me making mistakes and learn from those mistakes and we have the right to make mistakes. We're talking about people who have the ability or are literally walking WMDs, right? If they fucking make a mistake, there are a lot of people are going to die. We don't think that the logic applies to very powerful people. The response was non-existent because when we told you examples of how people like Iron Man effectively decided to make their own decision and start a war with an artificially with a, with a robot and they eventually created a lot of collateral damage, we don't think that the state of the particular institution was then held accountable or had any ability to voice out their opinions to detract the efforts of Iron Man to create the artificial intelligence called Ultron. Effectively, we argued to you that collateral damage is something that's going to affect a lot of people. We argued to you also that by virtue of you having a lot more power, that doesn't really mean that you're going to think a decision with the perspective of a lot of other individuals. We argue to you that it's in the best interest of yourself as a superhero, as well as for the state, as well as for crime fighting, for you to consider the state. Thank you. 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 Thank you.